belong to the King. What a great truth to remind ourselves of. Welcome to our evening service. It's good to see each one back out. And uh, the days are lengthening. So it's, we've turned the corner and uh, I always enjoy December knowing, okay, now we're getting a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Pretty soon we'll be back in church in the light and eventually uh, all, all, even Wednesday night will be in the light. So good to have one, each one back. Uh, in terms of weekly schedule, uh, just note the uh, deacons, we do have our meeting and your agenda should be in your box for Tuesday evening. And youth, uh, Friday, uh, there's a teen retreat at Windcrest Bible Camp for those attending that. And uh, those who are not attending can head to the church for 6.30, 8.30 for youth group here. And that'll be general policy throughout the year. Every two weeks is youth group. We're just going to keep that consistent for the group here. And then those that go off to retreats is great as well. Uh, other than that, I think that's all the time. I, I wanted to mention as well tonight the discipleship ministry. Uh, if you are uh, still interested in, in uh, joining up, please sign up this Sunday and then we'll get those groups together uh, for the end of the month. So if you're interested, I know a number of you have signed up. A number of you told me, can we just keep going with our same groups? Yes, absolutely. Um, but uh, if you do want to join in on that, please sign up and we'll get that started again in the new year. All right, that's all the time we'll take for announcements. Let's begin with a song. Andrew's going to come and lead us when I see the blood. Good evening. Let us all stand as we sing together. When I see the blood, we will sing all the verses of this song. Rise, our Redeemer, died on the cross. song talking about when I see the blood the Passover all right so Exodus chapter 12 in order to be saved from the death of the tenth plague they had to put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils the blood of a lamb and when they saw the blood on the doorposts and lentils he would pass over the house and would not kill the firstborn and uh, it's important to know what we're singing and why we're singing it and when we see the blood of Christ is what our uh, sins are atoned for and when Christ, God sees that blood applied to our account he passes over the death that should be ours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful sacrifice of Christ. Thank you for his perfect shed blood that does atone for our sin, and we're thankful that we can know of our forgiveness and of our salvation in him, and thank you for the delight it is to sing of that glorious truth. And Lord, we just pray that you would gather with us tonight, that we might hear from your word, that we might be encouraged and challenged and shaped to be more like Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to grow and to grow up into him, our head, Lord, I do pray that you would minister physical strength to those who are ill and that you would, uh, Lord, help those particularly recovering from surgery in a hospital to be restored to our fellowship soon. Lord, I pray that you would minister to their hearts, give them peace and grace, uh, Lord, to be sufficient for this trial and to guard them in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that you strengthen them and restore them to us. And Lord, we thank you for the life and breath and strength you've given us. May we honor you with it here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Our next hymn is hymn number 252 in your books, Nothing But the Blood. We will sing first, third, and fourth verse of this song. Updates, the Brass and Gars missionary letter, and Pastor Freeman's going to come and read it to us. This is obviously from the Brass and Gars, as Pastor mentioned, and they open with Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, which says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas in 2023. We have been talking about how wonderful it is that we know why Jesus came to earth and why we celebrate Christmas. But there are so many people that do not know him. May God send more people to tell those that do not know. Uh, they have a, a number of pictures in their letter, so I would encourage you as, as uh, when I'm done this, I'm going to put it over there. You can have a look at it. They have a prayer card and lots of pictures on the second and third page that they, they share with you. So certainly have a look at that after the service. But they go on to say, uh, in the last few months, we have traveled about 9,000 kilometers to share our burden for children in Chad with many churches and individuals. We are happy to be back in Moncton for several weeks to celebrate Christmas with our family. We are so excited to share with you that we have heard from the mission that we are now at 40% promised of our needed monthly support. Thank God for how quickly he is bringing in our support. Thank you for all your prayers on our behalf. God protected us, kept us, and gave us strength. And we ask you to keep praying as we head out again in the new year to continue meeting with people until our support comes in. Uh, they also have a, a Kemda Orphan Ministry update. It's the second part of their letter. It says, thank you for praying and giving for the work, uh, for the work with children in Kumra. We have little difficulties with the kids and workers that come up from time to time. Obed does his best to deal with these over the phone, but we are considering whether he will need to travel to Chad again for a few weeks early next year. Pray with us about this, please. We organized the annual Christmas party for the street kids on December 23rd. A big group of happy boys, uh, happy boys showed up. We were able to follow along on a video call, and it was so fun to chat with the boys and our babies. We were wishing uh, we were there with them all. All the kids got a lovely set of new clothes, a great holiday meal, and our helper, uh, told Tamaji, shared the Christmas story and the reason that Jesus Christ came to earth as a baby. The kids learned some Christmas songs, and the day was a, was a success. Pray for each of these boys to understand the message shared and to accept Christ as their Savior one day. And it ends off with, In Christ, Obed, Lacey, Israel, Jemuel, Susie, and Reuben. 
Great to have the Brass and Gars back for a few weeks and then they're heading out so we won't see them again for another, another stretch here uh, through January and February, but let's take their needs to God in prayer tonight. Father, we come before you and we do again rejoice in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're thankful that Christ did come and you sent him and that he, unto us was born a savior. And we're thankful for the opportunity of this outreach in uh, Kumra, Lord, to be able to reach these street boys and share the gospel message with them and to share your love with them uh, through gift giving and this uh, Christmas gathering. I pray that the gospel would bear fruit in their hearts and in their lives. And Lord, for the little babies as well, that you would care for them and protect them. Lord, we do ask for prayer as well, for wisdom, as Obed considers a need and necessity of traveling over for a couple weeks to, uh, f uh, to deal with issues. I just pray that you would give them wisdom and uh, be able to discern what is best there. And Lord, we just continue to pray that you would be with them as they travel. We thank you for the raising of support this fall. And uh, Lord, we give you praise for 40% uh, committed support. We just pray that you would continue to help them as they travel now in January and February and March, that you would uh, open doors for them to be able to present their ministry. And Lord, that we'd see that support increase, uh, Lord, to the 75%, so they might be able to be at launch seminar this summer. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to do your work through them, uh, even as they travel. And uh, Lord, encourage the saints through them as they are encouraged by them. We just pray that you would undertake and bless them. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll continue singing. Andrew. Our next hymn is hymn number 259, The Cleansing Way. We will sing all three verses. <laughs> a fountain. Let us all stand as we sing first, second, and fourth verse of this song.
good. What a wonderful theme, redeeming love to be till we die. There's a phrase that you will likely hear in our North American world. No one is above the law. No one is above the law. And the idea there is that justice is supposed to be applied equally. It's not supposed to matter how wealthy you are or powerful or famous. It's supposed to be that if you commit a crime, you do the time. You pay the punishment that the crime deserves. That's the ideal in terms of justice, equality, fairness, that everybody is equal. We are all stand equal before the law. But has that always been the experience that we have had? Has it always been the reality in our Western world that justice is equally meted out? And I think we could say with some uh, honesty that no, that's not always the case. (laughs) Sometimes the rich and famous do uh, get off on things that they probably shouldn't, and sometimes the poor that don't, can't defend themselves uh, get punished and, and there's injustice. And we know of famous cases of, of convictions that weren't actually true and somebody was just a fall guy for the, the conviction and so on. Justice is not always equal. But the reality that I want us to consider tonight is, is that true of God's justice? Is everyone fairly treated with God's justice? Is no one above God's justice? Is everyone equal in God's sight? The Assyrian Empire was massive in the day of Nahum. Nahum was writing in the 600s and to the city, particularly of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was the world power, it was the dominating force. And they didn't really treat people fairly, but it didn't matter. Who was going to bring justice on the Assyrians? I mean, who was going to stand up against them? Who was going to punish the king, Ashurbanipal or Shalmaneser or any Sennacherib, any of these Assyrian kings, because they just won. They defeated their enemies all the way down into Egypt, as we're going to see tonight. They ruled over the known ancient world, and it seemed like there would be no justice. It seemed like all of their violence and all of their wickedness would go unpunished. But God sends this little prophet named Nahum, only three chapters, to remind us that God's justice is never mocked. And that no matter how powerful or large a nation may be, or how important a person thinks they are, the reality is all of us will be judged by God. All of us stand underneath His justice. And so in Nahum chapter 3, I want to encourage our hearts, and I also want to challenge our hearts. I want to encourage us that the wickedness of this world, sometimes we can think, well, I'm just such a small part of this world, and there's bigger actors at play, there's more going on, and... And they seem like the wicked get away with it. It seems like they do wicked things and they they don't get justice. And I want to encourage us that God does bring the justice on the wicked. God does punish them. And so we can be encouraged in that. I also want to challenge us that the wicked are not so far from home. That the wicked are not just out there somewhere. That if we are honest, that what we see the Assyrians and their wickedness, we may find traces of it in our own heart. And what do we do with God's justice when it applies to us? We like it when it applies to somebody else. (laughs) I'm sure in our hearts and minds, you've all thought of somebody rich and famous that you're hoping one day will receive God's justice. (laughs) You're glad if they they were uh, brought to, to justice. But the reality is all of us face God's justice. And unless we come by that wonderful way provided by Jesus Christ at the cross, we all will face God's wrath. And so in Nahum chapter 3, we're going to finish our series in the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter 3, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot. The mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters 
for you. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for its truth, and I pray that you would guide us by your spirit into it, that we would understand it, and be encouraged, and be challenged, and Lord, that you would shape our hearts and minds by its truth tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the beginning of Nahum chapter 3, the announcement of judgment. Anytime you see this little word woe in the prophets, you understand that this is a woe oracle. It is a statement of God's justice, of his judgment. And there is no going back. <laughs> when God pronounces woe, you are being punished. This is, you're, you're receiving his justice. And so, who is this woe upon? It's a woe to the bloody city. The bloody city, and it's specifically to Nineveh, as we see later in verse number 7, Nineveh is laid waste. But really, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. This is a map of the Assyrian Empire and its vast domain over the, the region of the Fertile Crescent, or Mesopotamia in the ancient world. Nineveh was pinpointed, I don't know, Isaac, if you can zoom in for me, but pinpointed in the middle there uh, with, the, with the lines coming out of it, the red and green lines coming out of it that were uh, kings that, that took conquest down into Egypt that we're going to look at later. But Nineveh is sort of central. It's on the Tigris River. There it is. You can see it a little bit better now, hopefully, where the lines come out. It is the, the central city. It's called here a bloody city. I'll give you a quote from Shalmaneser III, one of the Assyrian kings. He says, I slew their warriors with a sword, descending, descending upon them like Adad when he makes a rainstorm pour down. In the moat I piled them up. I covered the wide plain with the corpses of their fighting men. I dyed the mountains with their blood like red wool. I took away from him many chariots, horses broken to the yoke. I erected pillars of skulls in front of his town, destroyed his towns, tore down their walls, and burnt them down. Nice guy. Good neighbor. <laughs> that was one of the kings of Assyria. He would go and destroy, and when he destroyed, he would take all the skulls of his enemies and stick them on pillars and put them in the front of the town. What was the point? To say, look, I conquered you, and I destroyed you, and anybody who tries to fight against me, well, this will also happen to them. They liked to decorate with the corpses of their enemies. They were vile, bloody people, and very violent. And I, I actually had another quote that I, I felt was too gruesome for the, the younger audience, so I didn't, I didn't uh, bring it. But they're, they're the things they did to their enemies, the violence and the blood that they shed, it is rightly named the Bloody City. They were a violent, wicked People. Not only did they kill and, and, and destroy, but in verse number one, they are full of lies. They're dishonest. They are not uh, your upstanding people of integrity. They are liars. And not only do they lie, but they rob. They steal and plunder from others what is not theirs. And so they look across their gates and say, I wonder who's out there that we can defeat. I wonder who else we can plunder and take their possessions for ourselves. And so they spread out and they went and attacked other nations and conquered and killed them and took all that was theirs. And Nahum ends this with verse 1 with its victim or its prey never departs. There's a constant victim. There's a constant prey. The idea here is of food as they prey upon these nations, they're consuming them, that it's never departing. There's always somebody that's a victim. There's always somebody that is being preyed upon. The Assyrians never sat down and said, you know what? We have conquered enough territory. We're good. We have a big enough nation. There was always another victim, always somebody else to defeat, always somebody else to kill and to make war with. So did they deserve God's justice? Was this woe an appropriate woe upon them? How many commandments have they broken already? <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. Woe to the bloody city, its victim never departs. They shed a lot of innocent blood. <laughs> so they, they, they violated that command. Thou shalt not bear false witness. It's full of lies. They broke that commandment. Thou, thou shalt not steal. And they rob. And they've broken three of the ten already, just in verse one. They are certainly worthy of God's judgment. And so the reason for this justice, the reason for this woe is given to us in verse number one. It is fully justified that God would bring his punishment upon this nation. Nobody's going to sit back and think, well, they're really nice people. I mean, they don't deserve this at all. They're such kind and generous and loving people. No, <laughs> they were wicked and cruel and violent and God is bringing justice upon them. And as we think about the woe upon this nation do we see any similarities to ourselves? Have we ever been full of lies? <laughs> Have we ever taken what was, wasn't ours? Have we ever broken the commandments? I think the reality is all of us could fit in verse 1. We may not be as violent as the Assyrians. 
The reality is all of us are sinners. And all of us rightly are underneath the just wrath of God. Woe to you, bloody city. So what is going to happen? Well, verse 2 and 3 in this announcement of judgment, verse 2 and 3, Nahum pictures their defeat. He pictures what's going to happen as the Babylonian army, which he doesn't tell us is Babylonian here, but that's what's going to happen, is going to destroy Nineveh in 612. This is what's going to happen. You're going to hear the noise of a whip and of rattling wheels. As the charioteers whip their horses and rattle on into battle, you're going to hear this galloping horses, clattering chariots. And so he's picturing this war that's coming upon Nineveh, the bloody city. And horsemen are charging with their bright swords and their glittering spears. He's picturing this intense army full of chariots and horsemen that are coming to attack Assyria and attack Nineveh. And what is going to happen at the end of verse 3? There's going to be a multitude of slain. The, the corpses are going to be a great number, countless, he says, of people that are going to be dead. And in fact, the horses and chariots are going to stumble over corpses. It's pretty graphic. <laughs> but, but Nahum says, judgment is coming upon you, and this army is going to invade and kill you, and they're going, to, they're going to so destroy you that they're going to be bumping over top of dead bodies as they carry on their conquest in Nineveh. They are going to be destroyed, the Assyrians and, and Ninevites. And, and, and again, as Nahum is prophesying this, everybody who's reading this is thinking, really? Like, the Assyrians? This is what they do to other people. This is how they conquer other nations. And Nahum says, oh, but God is going to get them. God's justice is going to come upon them. And one day, the violence and the bloody realities that they have put upon other people, they're going to be the recipients of it. They're going to reap what they have sown. And God's justice system, Galatians tells us, is never mocked. You reap what you sow. And their bloody violence is going to come back upon them. And they're the ones who have slain so many corpses. They're going to be the corpses. And God is going to bring his justice upon them. And throughout this section of announcement of judgment, Nahum is saying, you're going to be judged, here's why. You're going to be judged, here's why. And so he goes back to another reason in verse number four, because of the multitude of harlotries. Because the, the, the magnitude, the, the many, many ways in which you seduced other nations. The mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. And so they have enticed other nations to follow pagan gods. They have enticed other nations to not serve the one true living God. And certainly God's people were that way. Do you remember when Rabshakeh came against the wall? And you can read about it in Isaiah 36 to 39. But the Assyrians said to him, don't trust God. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He's going to try to make you trust God. Don't do that. We've defeated all the other gods. We will defeat you too. Don't trust God. They had said to even, you remember, to, to, to the people, if you have been enough to, to provide for the horses and chariots, we'll give you 2,000 chariots. We'll take you into captivity and we'll, we'll give you a vine and a fig tree in captivity. You can come to Assyria. It will be beautiful. It will be wonderful. We'll provide everything you need. Were they being honest? No, they were seducing them into surrendering. And when they surrendered, they were not going to have a vine or fig tree. They were going to be enslaved. And so they were liars. They were seductive harlots who were calling people to false worship. And harlotry is often connected in the Old Testament with false worship. They are going to try to bring people in under their gods, under their pagan system of worship, and say, our gods are supreme. And God says, you who have seduced these nations, who have seduced others to follow false gods, behold, in verse 5, I am against you. Those, wor those words should cause you to shake. If God is against you, then you are done. There is no one who can stand against God. Now, thankfully, in Christ, what does Romans 8 tell us? If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, it works the other way. <laughs> so if God is on our side, if God is saving us, there's no one that can destroy us. But if God says, I'm against you, you had better be, you had better be shaking <laughs> to recognize that God is the one who is against you. And who is God against? God is always against the proud. He's always universally against these proud Assyrians who exalt themselves above God, who say that they, they are the ones who are God. Oh no, <laughs> you will be brought down. I am against you, says the Lord. And God is always against the proud, but he exalts and delights in the humble. And so he tells them in verse number five that he will lift their skirts over their face and he's playing on this harlotry reality. 
and we'll try to be careful with this, but he's, he's saying basically you have prostituted the other nations and I am going to make you shamed. I'm going to put your skirt over your face and I'm going to show the nations your nakedness. I am going to, to, again, bring your own sin upon yourself. Your violence is coming back upon you. Your harlotries are coming back upon you. What you have sown, you are going to reap. And your wickedness is going to come back upon you. And I'm going to bring your kingdom to shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you and make you vile. And so you, again, in Nahum's day, the glories of Assyria and their beautiful cities and their glittering gold and everything that, that they were, and God says, I'm going to bring it and make it filthy, make it abominable and vile. What you are truly in your heart is going to be on display, and I'm going to cast filth upon you and make you a spectacle. All the nations are going to see your destruction. They're going to see your downfall. And so it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Wow. This city that was the height of the world power is going to be laid waste, destroyed. Think of the greatest city on earth that you can think of. A great power, a great uh, commercial and economic and, and military power. It has a great city. That's Nineveh. And we can think of, of some perhaps to the south of us, these great cities built up with incredible infrastructure. But Nineveh, this great world power, is going to be destroyed and laid waste. And where shall I seek comforters for you? And there will be no comforters for you because you, you are getting what you deserve. This is exactly in line with God's justice. Your violence and your wickedness and your harlotry is going to be returned upon you. You're going to reap what you have sown. She is going to be destroyed. And so Nahum brings this announcement of judgment, this announcement that God is against you, Assyria, and I'm going to destroy you for your sin. And it's justified. This is, this is entirely justified for God to say, I'm going to destroy them because of their wickedness. But then we have the assurance of judgment. Because anytime God brings a message of judgment, there's something seductive that goes on in our hearts. <laughs> it's a little lie. It's a little whisper from the devil. Anytime God announces judgment, the devil's lie is this. God won't actually do it. God won't actually do it. And this is as old as Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 1, God made man and told them, you may freely eat of any of the trees of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, because in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely, what? Die. That's an announcement of judgment. You are going to die if you eat that. What does the devil come along and say to Eve in Genesis 3, 4? You will not surely die. You won't, you won't be punished the way God says he will punish. You won't face God's wrath and his justice like he says. You will not die. And this is the lie that comes every time there's announcement of judgment from God. Oh no, it's not going to be that bad. What happened in the days of Noah? A preacher of righteousness, 120 years. What's Noah saying to the people? God's going to destroy the earth. God's going to destroy the earth. God's going to destroy the earth. There's a flood coming. I'm building this large ark, which seems rather odd since there's never been a flood before, <laughs> or rain. I'm building this boat. God's going to judge. And what do the people say? No, they believe the lie. Believe the lie of the devil. God's not going to judge. God's not going to send a flood. How many people got on the ark? Noah, his wife, and his three sons, and their three wives. Eight people from a world population. We don't know the exact numbers, but the amount of years and the amount of sons and daughters that were born, it's a significant population. Only eight people get on the ark. Why? They believe the lie of the devil. They believe the lie that God isn't going to punish sin like he said he was. And this happens even today. Maybe it's happening in your heart tonight. When God says the soul that sins, it shall die. When God says the wages of sin is death, he's not kidding. He's not joking. When God talks about eternal punishment in the lake of fire, he's not making things up. He's not, he's not pretending. He is telling you what sin deserves and what, it, what punishment is coming. He's, he's a just God. And he announces his judgment. And the devil comes along and says, no, no, God's not like that. And our society has bought that lie, hook, line, and sinker. We can sin with impunity. We can sin and it doesn't really matter. There's not going to be a justice. There's not going to be an accounting at the end. They say things like, well, I'm sure my good will outweigh my bad. If you understood the justice of God, your one bad means death. 
and eternity in the lake of fire. There is no outweighing of good and bad. There's no making it up. You, you, are, you are before a holy, just judge, and in, in your sin, you are facing eternal punishment. That's what it is. That's what God says it is. And anything less than that is believing the lie of the devil. Anything that is, that is mitigating the justice of God is believing the lie of the devil, and it happens here too. And so Nahum says to verse number 8, Are you better than no Ammon? Why does he have to say this? Because the lie is being perpetuated. Oh, Nahum. That's not going to happen. Assyria, they're not going to be destroyed. Nineveh, no way. And so now he's going to assure them, oh, yes, you are. Don't believe the lie that you're not going to be judged. Are you better than no Ammon? And what is no Ammon? No in Hebrew, it is called Thebes in Greek, which is why on the map here you'll see Thebes. I don't know if Isaac can zoom in a little bit for me there. It's a little hard to see. But there is Thebes at the bottom end of the Nile River. And Ammon was the patron deity of this place called No in the Hebrew. This place, No Ammon, is a location at the bottom of the Nile River, a low point, and it was a city in Egypt. It was a beautiful city in Egypt. It has a long history in the Egyptian empire, and you can do the research if you want of, of, of the beauty of Thebes and all of, of, of what it was. But this, this city was thought to be unconquerable. It was thought that you couldn't beat it. It was surrounded by the river, and so he says in verse 8, Are you better than Noah, Ammon that was situated by the river, that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea? I mean, this city had the Nile River protecting it. In order to get to the city, you had to deal with the river first. <laughs> what a great bulwark, what a great fortress, because no army can, can effectively cross over a river and then fight against your city. You, you, have, to, you have to contend with the water first. And so... It was well situated, it was well protected. Not only was it protected geographically in, in terms of uh, the topology, but it was also protected because of the amount of people that were on its side. And so in verse number 9, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. Egypt, of course, is in, 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 situated there by the Nile River. Ethiopia, or Cush, is just to the south of that. Now it's modern-day Sudan and, and, and a bit of modern-day Ethiopia, but, th but this was the, the ancient uh, reality of Ethiopia, or Cush, and it was protected by both the nation of Cush as well as the nation of Egypt. And then it says in verse 9, and it was boundless, Put and Lubin were your helpers. And so if you can zoom back out for me, Isaac, Put and Lubin are to the west, modern day Libya and, 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 and northwest Africa. But that region there is where this nations were. So all of these nations together are your helpers. In other words, if Assyria crosses over the Nile and comes down to attack Egypt, who is going to join forces? Put Lubin, Cush, or Ethiopia, and Egypt. Four nations are going to come together and try to protect this nation, protect this city. And that's what they did. They had a limitless, almost, supply of soldiers. They had the geographical advantage in terms of being a protected city with the river. They had every advantage. There was no way that this Thebes was going to fall, this no Ammon was going to fall. And yet, in verse number 10, what happened? Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. This, this unconquerable city was destroyed. It was destroyed later as well by Alexander the Great. But what was thought was unconquerable is destroyed. And who is it destroyed by? Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian in 666 BC. So Nahum is drawing from Assyria's own history and saying, this, this city that was supposedly unconquerable, you conquered. You defeated. And so when you say, oh no, we won't be defeated. Oh no, God's judgment is not going to happen to us. Are you better than, than Thebes? Are you better than this, this city? They thought they were unconquerable, and guess what? They faced the justice of God, and God used you as an instrument of justice upon them. And so her young children were dashed to pieces, in verse 10, and at the head of every street they cast lots for honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. They faced the reality of war, and of defeat, and of slavery. And these people who thought that they had every advantage, geographically and militarily, that they would never be defeated, they lost. They faced my justice. And so don't you think, Assyria, don't you think, Nineveh, that you can somehow escape my justice? Don't think that you are unconquerable. 
Don't think that my justice doesn't apply in your case. Don't listen to the lie of the devil that my justice will not be upon you. Verse 11, you also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You will also seek refuge from the enemy. I will do to you what I did to Thebes. I will do to you what happened to this other nation when it was sacked. To the naysayers who would say, no, Nineveh is never going to be destroyed. God says, oh yes, it is going to be destroyed. I will bring it to pass. And so there's the assurance of God's judgment. And he uses a number of pictures, as the prophets like to do, to, to tell them that this is going to happen. He uses the fig tree in verse number 12. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. Now, we don't have fig trees. I don't think anybody has a fig tree at their house. <laughs> uh, I've seen a number of them in Israel. But perhaps we could say we, you are apple trees. Might be a little easier image to, to think of. But every tree has fruit, and the fruit that every fruit tree has fruit, but the fruit comes and it ripens, and when it gets too ripe or, or gets ripe, it starts to become soft and fall off. It, it'll fall to the ground. And so our apples do this. They grow in our trees beside our house, and then they get ripe, and then the wind comes and they fall to the ground. And this is the picture. You're like that tree with all those ripe figs. They're just weighted down, they're just hanging down, and they're gonna fall. And what are they gonna fall into in verse 12? If they are shaken. They're going to fall into the mouth of the eater. It's like somebody's ready to gobble them up. He's sitting underneath the apple tree, just waiting for the apple to fall to, to hit them in the mouth. Now, sadly, my wife got one in the eye <laughs> instead of in the mouth uh, when the apple fell. Uh, but that, that reality, the idea of, of sitting underneath that tree, just waiting for that ripe fruit to fall off. Can't wait. And then as soon as it falls off, you're eating it. This is the picture that Nahum says. This is what you are, Assyria. In your city, you're like a big ripe fig tree. And, you're, and you, all your figs are just drooping down. And as soon as you're shaken, you're going to go right into the mouth of the eater. You're going to be just eaten up by the one who is coming. Surely your people in, you are mid, in your midst are women, in verse 13. And my apologies to modern day women, but women were not thought of as fear, uh, fearless warriors. All right? I know that that has become a modern theme in a lot of movies. And the heroine is now a woman and she's a conquering hero and the warrior and all the, the comics. And she's the, you know, the strong independent woman that's going to destroy the world and, and conquer. All right? That was not the case in Nahum's day. All right? and, 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 and so the idea here is all your people are fearful women. That's what it is. They, they are not strong warriors. They are not strong defenders. They are, in fact, women, is the point there. And so, the gates of your land, in verse 13, are wide open for your enemies. Now, if you are trying to defend your city, you want your gates closed. You do not want them wide open. <laughs> but Nahum says, it's as if the gates of your land are wide open. It's like your enemies are being invited in. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. And so God is going to come and bring justice. Don't think that you won't face God's justice. You are, you are in, the, in, the, in a city that is open. It's wide open. The gates are open for your enemies. And fire is going to come in and just destroy you and devour the bar of your gates. And then the Na Nahum begins to mock. Elijah does this. You remember the prophets of Baal? And sometimes the prophets get, get a little bit of um, sassiness, if I can say it that way. They start to mock God's enemies. And so the mockery begins in verse 14. Draw your water for the siege. Go ahead. Get ready for the siege. And if you understand siege warfare in the ancient world, they would surround an, a city because the cities all had walls and gates. They would enclose the city and they would surround it. They would cut off all water supply and all food supply. And eventually the people would starve to death or they would surrender because they didn't have any supplies. This very classic uh, warfare technique in the ancient world. It took a long time sometimes up to three or four years, depending on the supplies that the per people had. And so Nahum mockingly says, go ahead, try to get ready for the incoming army. Try to get ready for the impending justice. Draw your water, fortify your strongholds, go into the clay and, and tread the mortar. Make a stronger wall, build some more bricks. Go ahead, make strong the brick kiln. Do whatever you think you can to defeat the armies that are coming against you. Go ahead. And he's taunting them. He's mocking them. You can do all this preparation. Go ahead. Try to protect yourself. Get your walls fortified. Draw your water. Get ready to go for the siege. In verse 15, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. There the fire will devour you. 
in your preparation, in your kiln work, which is, which is making a fire to dry the bricks to make your walls more fortified, there, that fire that you're using to try to defend yourself is actually going to devour you, is the picture. Every effort you make at avoiding God's justice and defending yourself is actually going to turn into you being destroyed even more. That fire is going to devour you. The sword is going to cut you off. And then he gets this other picture. It will eat you up like a locust. And so he uses this picture of the grasshopper or the locust. And this term here in verse 15 is of a young uh, locust. It's a canker worm in the King James or, or a, a, a grasshopper. And the idea of this term is when they, when they first, it's the first stage of a locust. And when they're in this stage, they are ravenous. They eat everything. They just, they consume everything. And then the more mature locust is the word that you have in, in the second half of verse 15. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. You have the, the grasshopper term and then the locust term. But the, the first term here is that, that first stage of a locust life when they, are, when they are eating everything in sight. And so the sword is going to cut you off and it's going to eat you up like a locust. Like a swarm of, of these grasshoppers, these locusts that are going to come in and just eat everything. And locust plagues and locust swarms are still a thing today in Africa. And they come in and they will just eat anything that is green. They will just eat up the land. And so God says, you can try to protect yourself. You can try to defend yourself, but it's not going to work. I'm going to come in and consume you like fire. I'm going to consume you like locusts. And the mockery continues... Make yourself many like the locusts. Go ahead. Try to multiply yourself. Try to get your defenses. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. And so you, you, you can try to defend yourself. You can try to protect yourself. You can try to get ready for this. But the locust plunders and flies away. The commandment, your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers who camp on the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. And so Nahum, again, is using this picture that they would have known well in the cycle of locusts. But he's saying a locust plunders and then flies away. That's what it does. It comes in, eats, and goes. And your commanders and your generals are like that. All your military men, your great uh, authorities, your, your great warriors, they're like these grasshoppers and, and these locusts. And they're going to be, as the locust is, when, when, they, when they camp in the hedges on a cold day. And, when, and locusts, of course, are cold-blooded. And so when it cools off at night, they will often go into the hedges and they will become stationary. And this is how you can kill them, by the way, if you ever need to deal with a locust swarm. But you can get them at night because they don't fly. Their, their, blood, their temperature goes down and they don't fly. And so they will often be burned up at night with fires to kill the locusts. But in the day, when the sun rises, what happens? As soon as the temperature comes up and the sun comes up, all of a sudden they get, they get the circulation going, they warm up, and they take off. And the swarm takes off again. So if you don't get them during the night, you're not going to get them. They, they are going to fly away. And so this is the picture that Nahum says is like all your commanders. Your justice is coming, and, and all your mighty men, all your great men of battle are like these locusts. And you have a lot of them. And they're all sitting around in the coolness of the day, but when, the, when it warms up, when the heat comes, when the pressure comes, what are the commanders and these great warriors going to do? They're going to desert you. They're going to abandon you. They're going to fly away. And, and their real colors are going to be shown. And so you can think, oh yes, we'll, we'll be prepared. We'll make our walls strong. We'll get our water ready. We'll, get our, we'll multiply our military. We'll, we'll build up our forces. Bring it on, God. <laughs> and Nahum says, they're all going to desert you. Your, your leadership is going to run away like cowards. When God comes in justice, and, and oftentimes people can look tough and act tough, but when God shows up, they'll, the, the true colors will show. <laughs> is there anybody who's going to act tough in God's courtroom in heaven? Is there anybody who's going to be full of themselves in God's courtroom in heaven? Anybody who's going to be able to stand up against God? No, like those locusts, when the sun warms up, they're going to flee away. They will be destroyed in God's presence. There is nobody who will stand up against God. And so these commanders and these generals Oh, they seem very boastful and very proud now, Nahum says. You've got lots of them, like the swarming locusts. But no matter how many men you get, when the pressure comes, when the heat comes, they're going to fly away. Your shepherds slumber, in verse 18, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. You will be destroyed. 
Mark it down, Assyria, mark it down, Nineveh. You will face God's wrath. You will be destroyed. And your injury is not going to have any healing. Your wound is severe. And everybody who hears what is happening in verse 19, news of you will clap their hands over you. They will rejoice over what has happened (laughs) of your destruction. And then this book ends with a question. This book ends with a very important question. Is this justice of God warranted? Is this the right thing? I mean, they're going to be destroyed. They're, 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 they're going to be killed. They're going to be corpses slain. The chariots are going to run over. Is it justified? And the authentication of judgment is found in verse 19. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? God asked this question at the end of this book, because it's a heavy book. It's a book of judgment. It's a book of destruction. God is a God of justice and righteousness, and he will bring judgment. And so when, when you have these heavy books of judgment, the question comes, but, but is this justified? And God leaves us with this question to answer it ourselves. Is it not justified? Their wickedness, upon whom has it not passed continually? Is Assyria not worthy of God's justice, this bloody city, this robbing, lying, seductive city? Is it not appropriate for God to bring them low, to destroy them? And this emphasized the reality of God's character of justice. There will be nobody who can say to God, you're not fair. God's justice is fair, perfectly fair. God is no respecter of persons, the Bible tells us. And anybody who faces the judgment and justice of God will never be able to stand in God's courtroom and say, God, it's not fair. It is fair. And what had God done? Do you remember another prophet that God had sent to these people? His name was Jonah. Do you remember how Jonah ends? Jonah ends with another question. Jonah ends with a question that emphasizes another part of God's character. Because the reality is all of us face God's wrath, and justly so, and none of us will stand before God and say, oh, it's not fair. The reality is our death and our punishment is warranted, but God is not only a God of justice. At the end of Jonah chapter 4, he says, should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Shouldn't I pity the kids, Jonah? And and we would say, yes, God, you should. God, you should pity the the kids. You should pity the the Ninevites. You should pity them. You're a merciful God. You're a God who is merciful on, on us human beings. And so in Jonah, God emphasizes his mercy to the Ninevites. But in Nahum, he emphasizes his justice. They deserve punishment. They deserve what they are getting. And why do they doubly deserve it? Not only because of their sin, but because they had repented in Jonah's day and had turned back from that. They had had the opportunity for mercy and they had rejected God. They had repented once in in Jonah's day, but they had returned back to their sin. And so not only were they guilty originally, but because they had received God's mercy and then spurned it, they are doubly guilty, doubly worthy of God's judgment. And so in Jonah and in Nahum, we have the emphasis of God's character. He is a merciful God. He he does pity us creatures, us sinners, but he is a God of justice as well. And if we spurn his mercy, he will bring his justice upon us. God is a merciful God, but God is also a just God. And if you think about that deeply, you will ask this question, how can both of those things be true? How can God be merciful when he is just? How is it possible? Because if he's merciful, won't he just overlook sin? Won't won't he just not punish? Won't he just have compassion and pity on us and our weakness and just let things slide? But if he's just, doesn't he have to punish us? Doesn't he have to destroy us? I mean, our sin warrants that. If he's a just judge, we deserve it. Where do these things find their balance? They find their balance at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in Psalm 85.10, it tells us that mercy and truth meet together. And righteousness and peace kiss each other. And they do so at the cross. Because on the cross of Jesus Christ, God is a just God. And the reason His Son has to die is because sin has to be punished. And he pours out all of his just wrath that the Assyrians deserved, and so do we, as robbers and liars and bloody people, we deserve the wrath of God, but he pours it out on his son. If God was not just, Jesus didn't have to die. 
He could have just just winked at our sin and said, no problem, I'll love you anyway. But sin had to be punished. And so Christ goes to the cross and justice rains down on the Son of God for three hours of darkness as he is forsaken by the Father to be our sin bearer. But mercy is also at the cross. Because God is not only just in punishing our sin, he is actually providing in his mercy the opportunity for us to be saved. To be pitied. To have our sins forgiven. And for us to come by faith and receive Jesus Christ and be forgiven of our sin. And so God is compassionate. And His compassion compels mercy. And His mercy is to offer us a way of salvation just as He did the Ninevites. My challenge to you is this. Don't spurn the mercy of God. The Assyrians did. They had a chance. Jonah preached to them. They repented. But then they forsook that. They didn't didn't continue on in following God by faith. And so God sends them Nahum years later to say you are going to be judged. The reality is God is not, he's, He's not seeking the reality of our death. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's left the door of opportunity for you to be saved. And so I'd encourage you, don't look at this passage and say, oh, that's just the Assyrians. They were bad people. They deserved it. If you're really listening, you will understand that we're the bad people who also deserve it. But God has made a way of salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ. His mercy is seen on the cross and His justice as well, that our deserved punishment is taken by Jesus Christ. And so receive that mercy. Do not spurn it. Because if you don't, you need to be warned. God is never mocked. And the way He says He will punish, He will punish. His justice will come. And so my first encouragement to you is to receive Christ's payment so you can be forgiven. Cast yourself upon him on the mercy of God by faith and receive his salvation. And if you have, be encouraged, Christian friends. (laughs) Be encouraged that God's justice system is never mocked. The wicked do not win and the wicked do not get away with it. And so if you have faced injustice, if you have faced the reality of the wickedness of this world, do not think that God has, has, has sort of turned a blind eye towards that. Recognize that God will bring justice. But if you have the heartbeat of God, you will move not only for the desire of justice upon those wicked, you will move to the pity of God and the mercy of God to actually desire their salvation. And this is the testimony of Stephen. Because Stephen is being stoned by wicked people. And what does he ask God as he's being stoned? He does not ask God to rain down fire from heaven and destroy them. That's James and John and the Samaritans. (laughs) They want God's justice, and God's justice is true. But a heart that's been captured by the mercy and grace of God wants that same grace and mercy for others. And what does Stephen say? Father, forgive them. Would you forgive them? Would 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 you shine your mercy upon them as you have shone your mercy upon me? People who recognize the justice of God and the mercy of God, who have received His grace, are people who are equipped to then ask God for that same grace upon others. So whoever in your heart and mind has come up when I said that the justice of God is never mocked, that God is going to get the wicked, and you're saying, yes, (laughs) I can't wait till that day. I have a few people in mind that I'm really excited about. Consider, are you praying for their salvation? Are you praying that they would repent and turn to God before it's too late? that they would receive the same mercy that you have received on the cross. Would it not be wonderful if our leadership of this country and, 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 and would turn to God, would turn to Christ and be gloriously saved and redeemed? Rest assured, the wicked in our country will be punished. But our heartbeat and our desire ought to be that they would be saved, that they would receive the same grace and salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. If they don't, be assured, no one is above the law of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word through Nahum, your prophet. Over 2,600 years ago, you spoke these words, but they are true and they are relevant. Lord, we have many proud, arrogant people who we know will face your justice. But Lord, we're thankful that you have sent a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that you have a plan of redemption and salvation, and that your mercy is available if they will call upon him by faith. So God, help us to be faithful ambassadors of your mercy and your grace to our lost world. Help us to be faithful ambassadors of your justice. That we would tell people there is punishment coming. That they would recognize that. That they would humbly repent and find the grace that we have received in Christ. Lord, if there's a heart here tonight who has never received that grace, may they come humbly and recognize that God's justice is true and it is coming 
but that it is available, salvation is available in Christ who took it on the cross. And we ask for these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. So we consider these truths. Let's sing hymn number one. I want to encourage us. Rejoice, the Lord is king. He's the one who rules over all. His justice system is never mocked. Even Assyria, the great nation of Assyria, will be under his rule. Let's stand together and rejoice in our wonderful king. Rejoice, the Lord is king. Rejoice, the Lord is king. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and joy evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and thank you for our wonderful triumphant Savior Jesus Christ and we do rejoice that you are over all sovereign over all that we can rest and trust in you and I pray that as believers we'd be encouraged with your truth tonight in Jesus name amen God bless